turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29, titled the message this morning, A Worthy Life. Pastor's message last week, if you were here, was titled The Beauty and Power of the Gospel. That message was very meaningful to me and really had an impact on me. I thought about it throughout that day. I thought about it the next day on Monday and have thought about it since. That's really what the preaching of the Word of God should do. It should impact us. It should weigh heavy on us. There should be a response to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. And that impacted me so much so that I intend for today's message to be a companion to it. This might be a little bit different than a typical Sunday morning message where there is expository preaching. I think you'll find that there's an element of that, but I really intend for this to be an application that is personal to us, to you and to me from that message. And if you remember, Pastor took us through 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses 12 to 17, and there we saw Paul's testimony. The Apostle Paul, who was Saul, who was a great persecutor of Christians, as Pastor mentioned, a terrorist by the definition, who was seeking to find Christians to bring them back to Jerusalem that they might be killed. And he was radically changed by the gospel, beginning at that road to Damascus. Radically changed by the gospel, changed his life, and he became a faithful and devoted servant of Christ. You know, that's what salvation does, right? Salvation radically changes, transforms a life. We were spiritually dead, dead in trespasses and sins. No life before we accepted Jesus Christ, the gospel. And he gave to us spiritual life. And then we are on a path of maturity and growth in our faith and in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Whom God saves, he sanctifies. And in salvation, he sets us apart from something to himself. He sets us apart from the world, from the flesh, from the devil, to himself that we would serve him, live for him, glorify him, and live for his good pleasure. We become disciples of Jesus. I think we know what that means. We become followers of Christ. And we seek to live like him and to fulfill the mission that he gave us as disciples. That we would seek to make other disciples. As pastor said last week, Christ Christianity is not a performance. Putting on a religious performance doesn't make one spiritual. In fact, the danger there is it may make one a fake, may make one a hypocrite. The pastor said something that was interesting, just the way it was worded, don't be a performance junkie in a religious garment. Be a Christ follower of Jesus. Let people see one who genuinely, genuinely reflects Jesus and is amazed at the grace of God in their life. Remember who you were before Christ, as the Apostle Paul did. He does that in a number of his epistles. He never got over the fact of what he was before Christ and who he is in Jesus Christ. It do us all good not to forget what we were before Christ. Oh, sure, maybe we didn't all live out depravity and the flesh the way we could have or the way the Apostle Paul did. 
But we were depraved, dead in our sins, enslaved in sin, and Christ rescued us. And he gave us new life, and we can live for him. Never lose sight of God's amazing grace to save a sinner like you, and then live passionately for Christ. When one is amazed with the grace of God in their life, they should be compelled to answer the question or to have the question and answer the question, what shall I do? What shall I do? Not answering with a to-do list, but developing an attitude of humility, of openness about where we are, a sensitivity, and then having a passion to live for Christ. So as I challenged myself and continue to do so with what I heard last week, I challenge you today. Are you living as that servant of Christ? Are you living a life worthy of the Lord who died that you might live? Think of what Christ has done for you. Colossians 1 and verse 10 Really, this whole passage, there's a number of verses before and after that have been important to me. It's a prayer that the Apostle Paul has for the church at Colossae. It's a prayer that I have had for the people that have been under my ministry, if I could say that. I pray this about our students in our school every fall, at the beginning of every school year. This is just a portion. If you want to open up your Bibles, look at the rest of Paul's prayer. This is just one part of it. He prays that we may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Are you living the Christian life as described and exemplified in the New Testament rather than some form of cultural Christianity of the day, which is something else Pastor Ted touched on last week. American cultural Christianity is so weak. It is so wimpy. It is so complacent, perhaps even apathetic. It's without much service and sacrifice. The American church has gotten silly to just entertain self and others and to have a very small view of worship. Worship is more than 20 minutes of what we do leading up to a preaching time. That is corporate worship. That's good. That's important. We We should sing these songs and sing them to the Lord and mean them from our heart. But just whipping ourselves up emotionally, feeling really good about that, and then walking out those doors and then living the rest of the week like the average Joe is not worship. Worship is a lifestyle. It's those things we do every day to show God his worth. Are we living a life worthy of the Lord? I was at a Russian church and Christian school in Massachusetts about two weeks ago. I found out that the largest population of Jewish immigrants and people from the former Soviet Union live in southern and western Massachusetts. I got to know some wonderful people from the Russian Evangelical Baptist Church and their school, which is called Westfield Christian Academy. I was on an American Association of Christian Schools uh, team doing an accreditation for their school, an accreditation evaluation to make a recommendation uh, whether or not they should be accredited by the American Association of Christian Schools. And we made that recommendation after being there for three days. I noticed right away when I was there some cultural differences, and I found them to be good. I found them to be 
positive. And when I say cultural differences, I'm talking about a lot of things. If you can consider what people went through that came from communist country that are Christians and now into America. I am thankful that as I spoke to those adults and I watched their kids in their Christian school, that it appears that they haven't been influenced too much by the American way of life. And whether that has to do with not being too influenced by progressive politics and a move towards socialism in this country, but also to see that they haven't adopted what I view as an American form of casual Christianity. I hope they can preserve that for future generations as their children and their grandchildren grow up in this country. These people were passionate about living for Christ in a country with religious freedom because they didn't know that before. And they suffered persecution for the sake of being identified with Christ. And they're very serious that they now live in a country where they can actually share the gospel. And they're excited about doing it. And they're doing it, and they're excited about being able to have a Christian school for their children and train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and help them to develop spiritually and grow in their spiritual life. Their love for God, their desire to serve Him was sort of striking to me. And last week, Pastor spoke of an American Christianity and encouraged us not to accept false definitions of spirituality. Don't accept false definitions of spirituality. Be spiritual. If you are genuinely saved, sanctification is taking place in your life. You're growing. You desire for that growth. And don't accept accept some Americanized version of Christianity. Just be a Christian. The, the, the the, the, The Christian who is a Russian immigrant shouldn't look different than us. Be a Christian. There's no room for complacency in the Christian life. No room for apathy in the Christian life. God rescued you if you've trusted in Him for salvation. He rescued you just like He did Paul. And then He's called you into service. Service is a privilege Some view it as a duty. It's a privilege. It is a responsibility, too. If you're a Christian, you have been called by God to serve. How are you doing with that? And when I ask you these questions, please understand, I've challenged myself with this beforehand. You folks have heard me say this over and over again. One of the blessings of being able to preach and teach God's Word is what God does in your heart in the preparation So when I say you, I'm speaking to me as well. Are we faithful to what God has called us to do? What are we living for? Because what do Americans live for? We live for ourselves. Are we living for ourselves, ourselves, or for the Savior? Where is our passion and our excitement to serve God and to live for His pleasure and glory? We should have a passion for that. But maybe we've, be- we've become content. Maybe we have become complacent. Hopefully not apathetic. Do we need a little shot in the arm? Do we need revival? Is God's transforming grace evident in your life or are you just talking the talk and putting on the performance that Pastor talked about last week? Do you live for God and serve Him because you are amazed by His grace and motivated by love to walk worthy of Him? Or have we left our first love? You know, in Revelation, we're told of a church 
that left their first love. I was thinking, how does that happen? I think it happens when the individuals in the church lose their first love. Maybe we need to return to the first works. Now, all that was an appeal to remember and to respond to what we heard last week and an introduction into what I would want us to look at this morning. What I would like for you to understand today is what God has waiting for you if you will pursue Him with all your heart, soul, and mind, with everything in you. And I want you to see the importance of giving your life to God, living for Him today, and being dedicated to living to Him all the days of your life. And I want you to see that a life lived for God is a life that matters and a life that has eternal benefits. So let's look at just a few verses in Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning in verse 11, I'll read through verse 13. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Here God is speaking to Israel through Jeremiah the prophet. His people had been under judgment for years for their idolatry, for their rebellion against him. They had turned away from God. And the prophet has 14 messages for the people. And this here in chapter 29 is part of the 14th and final message. And now his words are intended to give them comfort while they live in exile under Babylonian captivity. He is telling them to seek God and he is assuring them that if they will return to him, they will receive his blessings in the days ahead. You see, the way they lived mattered. And the way you and I live life matters greatly. How we live and what we do and who we become matters for all eternity. And we have one short span of life. Our life is but a vapor. It appears for just a little time. And we need to get this right And we need to live in pursuit of righteousness. We need to live in pursuit of righteousness. Yes, it is true that if you are saved, you have positional righteousness. But you will also pursue practical righteousness. I think sometimes when we try to emphasize one truth, we sort of, at best, neglect another. Everything pastor said Sunday, last Sunday, I agree with wholeheartedly about the Christian life isn't just a performance, a checklist, living by these sets of rules. But folks, it is true to understand that we receive the righteousness of Christ. This is how we're rightly related to God. Without that, because God is holy, we cannot be in his presence. And at salvation, we call it justification. And we ought to be amazed by that truth. That not by anything we did, that because we've come to God through Jesus Christ, one of the benefits of being in Christ is His righteousness is applied to our account. And because of that, we're rightly related, restored to fellowship with God. And then you know what happens? The Holy Spirit in you begins to sanctify you. And you actually begin to practice righteousness. We ought to be pursuing and practicing righteousness, desiring to do what is right for the glory of God and the pleasure of God. And for our young people, let me say this. I would like to say that the choices that you make today are setting the stage for how 
your life will be played out in the future. Live a life worthy of the Savior. Folks, what else is there to live for? Live a life worthy of the Savior. Have you ever noticed some of the meaningless things people live for? Have you, if I could say that, I know your mother told you not to use this word when you were growing up, but have you ever noticed some of the stupid things that people do for notoriety? I mean, there is a proper use of the word stupid. There's an improper use of it. But you ever noticed this? When I was a teenager, I remember watching the news as they reported on Larry Walters. Now, maybe that doesn't ring a bell. It might not ring a bell for you unless you're my age or older, right? I think I'm 56. So I'll have to ask my wife how old I am. You know how this works, right? When you reach a certain age, you stop counting. But maybe you'll remember this. He, he managed to enter restricted airspace in LAX airport on a lawn chair tied to weather balloons. Now, how many of you remember this guy? Okay, there's a few hands. <laughs> so let me tell the rest of you the story. Sitting in his North Hollywood backyard one day, he decided to tie helium-filled weather balloons to his lawn chair to see if he could make himself fly. He used 45 balloons and obtained liftoff. In his chair, he had soft drinks, he had sandwiches, a camera, a CB radio, and he had a pellet gun. Now, what was the pellet gun for, you ask? Well, it was to pop the balloons so that he could descend after his trip. Now, as you can imagine, things went wrong for Larry. He ascended much higher than he anticipated. He reached a level of elevation, an altitude of 16,000 feet in a lawn chair with balloons tied to it. At that point, Larry was afraid to pop any of the balloons. To make things even more terrifying for Larry, he entered the primary approach corridor of the Los Angeles International Airport where an incoming pilot radioed the tower that he had just passed a man in a lawn chair at 16,000 feet. You can't make this stuff up, right? Fourteen hours later, Larry shot a couple of balloons and began his descent into a Long Beach neighborhood. He had traveled 40 miles, and when he landed, he was immediately arrested and fined. Now, for his trouble, Larry was given a national spotlight on news programs and late-night television. Late-night television loved this guy. When asked why he attempted the crazy stunt, this is what Larry said. Well, a man can't just sit around. You see, apparently Larry was bored and he needed attention. He needed a mission. He needed something to do with his life. Today, as you know, we live in an era of reality TV where there are plenty of insignificant people that have risen to fame and notoriety for doing something silly. The world is full of people who yearn for their fame. People will go to great lengths to be noticed and to fill their hearts yearning for significance. Today we have social media influencers that have made silly videos that have gotten millions of views and because their silly videos have gotten millions of views, they must be people that are worthy of following <laughs> They're influencers. This is, our young, this is what our young people have to look to. My point in these illustrations is that people crave importance. They really crave having some value in life and are, will even turn to either seemingly meaningless or even silly things. And you know why that is? Because God actually made us to have purpose and mission. And that's why we need to find the right purpose. We need to have the right mission. P 
people want to fill their lives, uh, want their lives to count, to be someone. And as long as they feel important, they feel worthwhile. People will live their whole lives searching for some sort of significance and never truly find it. Now those might sound like silly stories, but here's my point. Folks, you can have significance in life. You can have real meaning and purpose in life. You can have a life that matters for all eternity. Not just here. Not just now. But a life that matters for all eternity and actually can impact others for Christ. What what gets you out of bed in the morning? What is the why behind everything that you do? Why do you do the things that you do? And again, to young people, what are your plans for the future? At some point, whether you realize it or not, young people, you'll begin going down a pathway, setting a course for your life. And where does that end? I am here to tell you that significance in life will not come from you. It will not come from within. It won't come by fulfilling your selfish desires. And it will not come in ways that your culture says it will come from. It won't come from worldly pursuits. It will not come from the accumulation of wealth or material things. It will not come from fame or prestige or popularity. You can have all those things and be spiritually starved. And don't we have examples of that in our culture? People that have everything this this world has to offer, but they're depressed, they commit suicide. They have all of those things. Folks, we can have all of those things and be spiritually starved. If you try to fulfill your life with anything other than God, you will be chasing after wind. Yet when you courageously embrace God and His purpose, you'll find abundant life. Loving and living for God will bring true and lasting fulfillment. He alone fills your heart. He alone satisfies. And He gives meaning and significance to life. So as we look at Jeremiah chapter 29, I want us to see that life matters in God. Our God is holy and just as well as loving and merciful. If we come to Him in repentance and faith, confessing our sin, He forgives us, He redeems us, He renews us. And He demonstrates His love toward us and He desires our love. Scripture calls Him things like a strong tower, a shelter, a rock. He is merciful to us. He provides grace and life. He has many promises for us. He protects, He provides, and He has a perfect will for our lives. He wants us to love Him, to follow Him, to honor Him. He wants us to trust Him and have faith in Him. And He desires for us to be His people. The passage of Scripture that we read earlier describes God's care for his people Israel. And those things were specific toward Israel at that time. Can I suggest to you that if you are saved, you're a child of God and you're one of his people. And this applies to us. God has set his eyes on you for good. He is your good God. Look again at Jeremiah 29. It's short. Let me just read it again. Will you follow with me? Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Look at God's heart. For his people, the almighty creator made you 
And he's not only thinking of you, but he has thoughts to do good for you. He has wonderful plans for you if you will live for him and follow him. God plans to guide you, to establish you, to cultivate your life, to bear fruit and bring him glory. This is not a God to run from. This is a God to run to. When we read of God's judgment, anger, and vengeance in the Bible, understand that his anger is towards sin and those who rebel against him. That is righteous, just, and fair. He hates sin. His holiness separates himself from it, but his love provides the solution for it. And just about everyone knows this verse, right? John 3, 16. For God so loved that he gave his only son so that if you will believe on him, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. Have you believed on him today? You know, if you've never come to that point in your life, we'd love to help you to understand the gospel, what it is, and its implications for you. We could do that for you. If you'll approach me or some of the others here, we'd love for you to accept Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. But again, consider this passage with me. It says there, God thinks of you. God thinks of you. When David pondered this thought, he said in Psalm 8, verse 4, What is man that thou art mindful of him? David was amazed that God was thoughtful of lowly man. Now think about it. God, the omnipotent one, the omniscient one, the creator of the universe, the almighty one who needs nothing, who lacks nothing, who is sufficient in and of himself, he thinks of you. He thinks of me. The sovereign Lord of all thinks of you. But not only that, God thinks good for you. He sets his eyes and thoughts upon you for good. He is concerned for your welfare. He has a good future for you. The scripture says in the New Testament that if you are a believer, that you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. You are his creation. You are his child. He made you on purpose for a purpose. He desires to make you and mold you into something for his glory. But not only that, God has a plan for your life. You get to participate in that. He has a specific role for you. He has responsibilities for you to carry out. He has tasks for you to fulfill. Now you can do that or you can come up with your own plan. Most of my ministry has been working with mainly teenagers, but young people. And I tell them that. So you, you can live for God's glory and for his good pleasure. Or you could come up with your own plan. You can live for the here and now. You can live for yourself. You can devote yourself to the temporal, temporary things. But folks, where does that lead us? Where does that end up? If that's what we do, live for yourself, your own plans, temporal things, the here and now. Give yourself to temporary things, and in the end, what do you have? You actually have nothing. You have nothing. And as the scripture says, you may gain the whole world, but in the process, you could lose your own soul. Or you could, uh, at least Larry was trying to do something, right? As silly as it was. But you could live a monotonous and unfulfilled life. Sleeping, eating, working, paying bills, rinse and repeat, right? Next day, you wake up, you go through the same old monotonous routine. Or you can live in a way that brings future reward in the kingdom of God. You can live for things 
that really have weight in eternity. And so here's this message is that life with God works. Life without doesn't. A life lived without God is wasted and worthless. Without God, there's emptiness, there's frustration, there's disappointment. I like history, I teach history. My mind went to John Sutter. Does that name ring a bell? It will as we talk about it. John Sutter was one of the first Americans to settle into the territory of California when it was still controlled by Mexico in the 1800s. John was an interesting man, quite an entrepreneur. He established Sutter's Fort, which is now central California. He obtained land from Mexico, entered into friendly labor uh, agreements with hostile Indians, and he made major developments in what would become Sacramento, California. In the 1840s, he decided to invest in constructing a lumber mill from his fort where he would make it rich by producing lumber, then floating it downriver to accommodate this rapid expansion that was going on in Central California all the way down to San Francisco. He was a man of great plans and aggressive vision. Through it all, he never anticipated in his wildest imagination the strange and tragic turn that his life would suddenly take in just one fateful morning. On January 24th, 1848, John's sawmill was becoming a reality. He hired a man named John Marshall, and Marshall was there to handle the construction project. Early one morning, Marshall was checking the mill's wheel to make sure that it was clear of any debris when something caught his eye. Resting on the bottom of the riverbed, were the first nuggets of gold discovered in California that would later lead to a gold rush. One might think that that would be the best news that John Sutter could possibly receive. Suspecting the rocks to be gold, Marshall bagged the fine, said nothing to anyone, nothing to co-workers, immediately took his discovery to John Sutter. After all, John was the landowner. After secret consultations, Sutter confirmed that the nuggets were indeed gold of the highest quality. What unfolded next, no one could have ever predicted. Sutter wanted to keep that a secret long enough for him to finish his mill. He thought his mill would be really the future to his financial security and stability. And I think you now know this story. Sadly, in just a few days, the secret leaked. Secrets are rarely kept, aren't they? Especially (laughs) secrets of this significance. And in the days that followed, Sutter's life was changed forever. We have a historic gold rush that began almost immediately. Hordes of greedy men and sometimes violent people descended right on Sutter's land. Right on his land claims. His land, his mill, his complaint were, I'm sorry, his claim were completely overrun. Pillaged by claim jumpers, squatters, and vagrants that were looking for quick fortune. A lot of gold was discovered in the following years and some did strike it rich. The only problem is that John Sutter never really saw any of it personally. He was ruined in a matter of months. Never recovered. The man who was instrumental in the founding of Sacramento, Sacramento, excuse me, the uh, settling of Central California and the historic discovery of gold died a relatively poor man. Near the end of his life, Sutter appealed to the United States government for compensation in his role in the events that literally shaped California and in some sense the entire nation. He died a few days before Congress turned him down. These are the words Sutter had made in his appeal to Congress. 
He said, by this sudden discovery of gold, all of my great plans were destroyed. Had I succeeded for a few years before the gold was discovered, I would have been the richest citizen on the Pacific shore, but it had to be different. Instead of being rich, I am ruined. On a much grander scale, consider King Solomon. Solomon sought life, sought to live life to the fullest and could have because he had access to just about everything. He had extreme wealth, extreme power. And we can read in Ecclesiastes that he chased after all those things and was ex able to experience all of those things. Everything that life had to offer. But if you read Ecclesiastes and you get to the end of the book, you hear his message. <laughs> and his message is this. When, love, when someone pursues life without God, it's meaningless and it's empty. All is vanity. If we want to live for this world, for material possessions, for selfish pursuits and ambitions... And my advice is that we enjoy it while we can because the day is coming when we will leave all those things behind. And God will hold us accountable for what we've done for him in this life. True living is found only in God. Significance is found only in him. Eternal purpose is found in his will. And everything else, folks, is a rabbit trail leading to nowhere. The psalmist wrote this, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16, verse 11. Folks, where are we? And by that I mean... Where are we spiritually? And my first appeal is this. Do you truly have a personal and genuine relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Have you given your life to him? Accepting the work that he did on the cross to save you from, the sin, from your sin. You have a sin debt that Christ paid and all you have to do to receive the benefits of his work is to ask in faith, believing, and turning from your sin to him, asking him to be your Lord and your Savior. Folks, that's the first step. But Christian, have you, have you left your first love? Have we become complacent? And as I told you when I started, the impact of Pastor's message last week was, as he began to talk about some of those things, I, I can see complacency coming and growing in my life. Are you living a genuine Christian life for God's good pleasure and His glory? Are you faithfully serving Him and telling others about Him as you're instructed to do? Folks, do, do we need revival? And so here's, here's the challenge. Here's the, the opportunity for response. Do we need revival? Do you need revival? That's a song. It's an old, old song. We take some time to just look at those words. We need to live passionately for the one who died for us, who paid the great price on the cross, sacrificing himself that we might live. God loving you so much that he gave his son that we might have eternal life. Can't we live for him? Please him. Glorify him. And do so 
passionately. Maybe we need to go back. If you're a believer, to your memory of coming to Christ in salvation. Do you remember that? Are we as fervent as we used to be? Do we need revival? Will you bow your heads with me as we close in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for who you are. The Almighty God, the creator of the universe, our creator. Lord, because of our sin, we are separated from you. But we are so thankful for your plan from eternity past to redeem man to buy him back, to purchase him out of, the, out of slavery of sin, to give life to the spiritually dead, that we might have eternal life. Father, as we read in your word in Romans, I pray that we would give our lives as sacrifices to you, the one who has sacrificed for us. Lord, will you give us more of a passion for you? Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.